Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Malik Yemen. I'm one of the pediatric cardiologists here at the Cleveland Clinic. Welcome aboard. I'm not sure what I did to, to get to be the first speaker, um, but I'll take that as a, as a privilege. So let's get this going. Everybody loaded on coffee. Good to go. Yeah, excellent. All right. This is easy. I'm only going to sum summarize my uh, you know, fellowship training, my entire fellowship training in an hour and a half. So, I mean, how bad can this be, right? All right, so the first talk is gonna focus on recognition of cardiovascular disorders. And so we're gonna focus on recognizing the main characteristics of an innocent heart murmur. Uh, what are some abnormal cardiac physical findings and uh, the most common pathologic murmurs? We like to uh, help you identify the main syndromes and associations with uh, cardiac disease. So we'll focus on some genetics the causes of chest pain in children, and then we're gonna talk about congestive heart failure, both in its chronic and acute form, all right? So critical for auscultation of cardiac murmurs is that we need to have an adequate, you know, good, good quality stethoscope. We need to have an adequate environment with low ambient noise. We like to focus all areas of the chest as well as the back, and we like to note changes with respiration and position. So here's a pop question for all of you. In a four-year-old child, which of the following features could be consistent with a perfectly innocent murmur? When it's louder in standing position, when it's variably split, when you have a variably split S2 with the murmur, when you have, when you have a murmur that's grade four out of six systolic ejection murmur at the left upper sternal border, when you hear a systolic click, or when you have a systolic ejection murmur at the right upper sternal border. So let's see what you guys answered. Excellent. And so variably split S2 is the correct answer because just remember, louder in standing position, that's usually not good. Uh, grade four or more is usually pathologic. You know, when we start talking about grade four or more murmurs, click is, is, is never good. And the systolic ejection murmur at the right upper sternal border, right upper sternal border is not a location of one of our commonly known innocent murmurs. So, whereas a variably split S2, as we'll explain later, is, a, is an innocent finding. All right, so this is a very busy diagram, but I'll just break down the main highlights of this. So just remember, we'll talk, and be talking about S1 and S2. So S1, just remember that both S1 and S2 are actually cardiac valve closure sounds. So they're cardiac valve closure sounds that create the S1 and S2. Remember, as a, you know, as, a, as a way to remember this, think that S1 signifies the beginning of ventricular contraction, and S2 is the end of ventricular contraction. So what happens at the beginning of ventricular contraction, S1? That's the closure of the mitral and tricuspid valves. And what happens when the ventricles are done contracting? Well, the semilunar valves, which are the aortic and the pulmonary valves, those close and those create S2. And then, um, so systole is between S1 and S2, and diastole is between S2 and the following S1. Now, S3 and S4 are extra hard sounds that you can hear in some people. Without going into too much detail, I want you to remember that S4 is always an abnormal finding. S4 always signifies abnormal filling of the heart, whereas S3 can be an abnormal finding, but it can also be found in perfectly healthy children. So a word about S2, okay? So S2, as we already established, is due to the closure of the aortic and the pulmonary valves in that order. So A2, then P2 is what constitutes uh, S2. Why A before P? Well, because A comes before P in the alphabet, right? Okay, so, so uh, and there's an, a variable interval typically between A2 and P2. Why is that? Because the right side of the heart is more sensitive to the inspiratory and expiratory changes that happen than the left side of the heart. So with inspiration, there's more filling of the right side of the heart. There is more flow going through the right, right ventricle and the pulmonary valve. And because of that, there is more flow going, and so there's delayed closure of pulmonary, of P2, you know. So the delayed closure of the pulmonary valve in relationship to the aortic valve. However, during expiration, there is less filling of the right ventricle, less blood flowing through the pulmonary valve, so the pulmonary valve closes, closes earlier, so P2 moves closer to A2. So that's what causes a normal variably split S2. So what are some pathologies about, uh, related to S2? 
First one I'd like to remember is a widely split S2. There are different things that cause a widely split S2, the most famous one being an atrial septal defect. Why? Because atrial septal defect will cause constantly more flow to be going through the right ventricle and the pulmonary valve, and because of that, the pulmonary valve is always delayed to close behind the, the aortic valve, so there's always a, an increased, a widely split S2 at a fixed interval. Or if we have a poorly mobile, slow to close pulmonary valve, so the pulmonary valve is very abnormal, thickened, stenotic, it will be sluggish to close, so it will always be delayed after the pulmonary valve. So the other cause for widely split S2 is pulmonary valve stenosis. Or if the right ventricle electrically activates after the left ventricle, such as what happens with right bundle branch block. So the left ventricle activates electrically, then the right ventricle activates electrically, so the pulmonary valve always closes after the aortic valve in a noticeable fashion. So these are the causes of widely split S2. On the other hand, you could have a single S2, such as if you have a single semilunar valve, such as with truncus arteriosus, you only have one semilunar valve, aortic atresia or pulmonary atresia, so one of the valves is missing. Or one of them is severely stenotic that it barely, it does not even produce an audible sound, such as what you have with severe aortic stenosis or pulmonary stenosis. Or one of them is just simply inaudible, and this happens with tra transposition in the great arteries when the pulmonary valve is so posterior that you cannot hear it. So these are the causes that you should remember of a single S2. Finally, a loud S2 typically happens due to a loud P2. And this happens with severe pulmonary hypertension, that the pulmonary pressure is so high that it just slams the pulmonary valve shut, and that produces a loud S2 due to the loud P2 component. So I want you to remember these important hints, and those will be on your final slides, about pathologic murmurs. So if you're trying to think, okay, what kind of pathologic murmur is this, think of the following clues. So if we're saying systolic ejection murmur, a systolic ejection murmur, think aortic stenosis or pulmonary stenosis. Why is that? Because the murmur doesn't happen immediately after S1. Why is that? Because there's a slight time lag between the beginning of ventricular contraction and the opening of the aortic and the pulmonary valves, and that's why these murmurs look like they're diamond shaped, so they don't immediately start after S1. On the other hand, if you have a holosystolic or pan-systolic murmur, we also call it S1 coincident murmur, the murmur starts immediately after S1 such as with a VSD, because if there's a VSD, there's a hole in the ventricular septum, as soon as the ventricle starts contracting, the, the left ventricle starts shunting blood through the VSD, so it is immediately after S1, or with tricuspid and mitral regurgitation, because immediately after the valves close, they start leaking and producing a holosystolic murmur. On the other hand, diastolic murmurs should make you think of either aortic or pulmonary regurgitation. That's when they're supposed to be closed, but instead they are leaky, and so you hear the murmur of aortic or pulmonary regurgitation, which typically looks diamond-shaped. It's, you know, um, it starts early in diastole and uh, gets uh, less loud. Or you have stenosis of the tricuspid or mitral valve. So this is diastole is the time that these valves are supposed to be open. And if they're not open very well, where you're going to hear a diastolic murmur of mitral or tricuspid stenosis, okay? And finally, continuous murmur. So continuous murmur, think PDA, because it's a vessel that connects the aorta to the pulmonary artery. There's always a pressure difference between the aorta and the pulmonary artery uh, throughout the cardiac cycle, and therefore this will produce a continuous murmur. All right, having mentioned some highlights about the pathologic murmurs, let's talk about the main famous innocent murmurs, starting with peripheral pulmonary stenosis. When we say peripheral, we mean branch, so the branch pulmonary artery stenosis. This is a systolic ejection murmur, typically no more than grade 2 over 6, best heard in the pulmonic area, left upper stone border, but also radiates to the lung fields, so in the axilla and the back. Uh, you hear it in the first three months of life. Why is that? Well, this happens because in utero, well, our lungs are filled with amniotic fluid, so there's very little pulmonary blood flow going on in utero. Most of the right ventricular output does not go to the pulmonary arteries. It goes to the PDA, to the aorta, so it can go to the placenta to get oxygenated. And suddenly after birth, this changes where, where, where now all the pulmonary artery blood is supposed to go into these relatively thus far underdeveloped branch pulmonary arteries, so that is what produces the turbulence and the murmur. However, if you start hearing it more than six months of life, now you're going to start that there is a pathologic uh, peripheral pulmonary stenosis rather than a physiologic one, because most physiologic ones would have closed, or not closed, but would have um, resolved by six months of age. So after that, think of pathologic pulmonary stenosis such as what you see with Williams syndrome.
All right, Stills murmur is another very common one. It's a systolic ejection murmur, could be up to grade three. These are the, the, the keywords you should remember. It's musical, it's buzzing, it's vibratory, like a twanging string. It is best heard at the left, mid, and lower sternal borders, typically one year to adolescence, but we've also heard it in infants. So it's really throughout the age span. It, it is increased by supine position. So being increased by supine position is a general feature of innocent murmurs, like many innocent murmurs, or fever. Anything that increases the cardiac output can accentuate this murmur. It is speculated to be due to vibration of blood in the left ventricular offload tract, and do not confuse this with the murmur of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which gets louder in standing position. I bolded that because I wanted you to remember it, whereas a stills murmur will get louder in supine position. A venous hum, remember that it is the only innocent murmur on the planet that is continuous. It is the only acceptable murmur that is accepted to be continuous and, uh, and innocent. So it is best heard in the right or left infra or supraclavicular areas, peak incidence at three to six years of age. Why is that? Because young children, believe it or not, have relatively big heads relative to the size of their body. So there is a lot of venous return going back from their heads, and that's what produces turbulence in the jugular veins. Because of that, it is better heard in upright position because that's when you have the most you know, gravitational pull, which makes it accentuated. And you abolish it, on the other hand, by making them lay supine. So you make them lay supine, uh, or you, you turn their head one way or the other, or you compress their you know, ipsilateral jugular vein, and you make the murmur go away. So if you know the, the main mechanism of the murmur, you will kind of uh, deduce their, their, its characteristics. So do not confuse this nice, innocent, continuous murmur with that of patent ductus arteriosus, which is typically more harsh and also does not abolish with the above maneuvers. This murmur, since it's a venous murmur, it's very soft and blowing, all right? So finally, pulmonary flow murmur. Why do we hear a pulmonary flow murmur? Because pulmonary valve is the most anterior valve in the heart. And because of that, it is relatively easier to hear flow through that valve more so than the other valves. And it is more in children and adolescents ages 8 to 14 because they have relatively faster blood flow and they have thinner chest walls um, than older patients. And it is maximum in the pulmonic area, mid-frequency systolic ejection murmur also louder in supine position. How do you differentiate it from other similar pathologic murmurs? Remember, this one comes with a normal S2, okay? So normal second heart sounds. If you hear a widely split S2, then think atrial septal defect. And this one also has no click. If you have a pulmonary murmur and a click, think of pulmonary valve stenosis. So this one has normal S2 and no click. And also, the right in, in, RV impulse should be normal. Carotid breathe can be heard at any age. It's turbulence in the carotid arteries as the blood leaves the aorta. Best heard, obviously, over the carotid arteries. Only during systole, it's a systolic ejection murmur. The difference between that and aortic valve stenosis is that the murmur of aortic valve stenosis radiates to the carotids and the suprasternal notch. So it is louder in the aortic area and less loud in the carotid areas, whereas a carotid breathe is heard primarily in the carotid area. So this is how you distinguish it from aortic valve stenosis. All right, so here's a very important slide. What are some clues that suggest badness, okay? So first clue, a whole is systolic murmur that suggests a VSD or tricuspid regurgitation or mitral regurgitation. Any diastolic murmur, because that means semilunar regurgitation or tricuspid or mitral stenosis. Any continuous murmur, except if it has the nice benign features of a venous hum, which we just explained. But all other continuous murmurs are bad. A harsh murmur, if you see the word harsh, VSD, valve stenosis, offload obstruction will produce harsh murmurs. Very loud murmurs. Now, I put grade three there, but grade, you know, grade three can still be an innocent murmur, but it's safe to refer those for evaluation. Uh, grade four is definitely a pathologic murmur. Murmurs heard at the right upper sternal border, that's in the aortic area, and that's not the location of a typical innocent murmur. If you hear systolic clicks, those suggest either aortic or pulmonary stenosis, or if it's in mid-systole, a mid-systolic click, then think mitral valve prolapse. Abnormal S2, so either a split S2, widely split S2 will suggest an atrial septal defect. Loud and single should make you think, again, of pulmonary hypertension, which slams the pulmonary valve shut, or transposition of the great arteries, 
And finally, very abnormally strong pulses, which happen with anything that, that causes runoff from the aorta, such as aortic regurgitation or patent ductus arteriosus, or weak pulses, which could happen with left-sided obstructive lesions, so no blood is coming out from the left side of the heart or little blood is coming out, if you have cardiogenic shock or if you have a pericardial effusion. And finally, if you have a murmur in a kid with symptoms or cyanosis, or the presence of extra cardiac abnormalities. This is from Harriet Lane, so I just put it there for you to kind of look at as a, as a helpful review. So pulse oximetry newborn screening, targeting newborn infants before discharge from the newborn's nursery at least at 24 hours of age. SAT should be obtained in the right hand and one foot. So you pass if you have a pulse ox reading of more than 90, more or equal 95% in either extremity with at most a 3% absolute difference between the arm and the leg. Immediate evaluation when the SATs of, uh, are less than 90%, obviously once you rule out any obvious infectious or pulmonary etiologies. And in the event of a positive screen, you either should do an echocardiogram if readily available or consult with pediatric cardiology. This is the algorithm, it's really simple. So this is the pass, which we already mentioned. So if you pass, you're good, you can be discharged. If you, if you fail less than 90%, then, um, then uh, you get referred. On the other hand, if they are in between, so SATs of 90 to 95% or more than 3% difference between the arm and the leg, then you, you know, give them some you know, slack, so you check them back in an hour, check them back in an hour, and if they three times in a row fail you know, to, to, to be cleanly in the normal range, then, then at that point you refer them. So this is the algorithm. All right, so let's talk about some genetic syndromes. Obviously, the genetic stock should cover in more depth, but I wanted you to kind of build that link in your head, association between genetic syndromes and some known congenital heart defects. So which genetic syndrome is associated with a triangular face, hemivertebra, and right-sided congenital heart disease, pulmonary stenosis, or such as pulmonary stenosis or tetralogy fellow? So triangular face, vertebral anomalies, and right-sided congenital heart disease. You can read the choices and put in your choices. So mixed bag, but uh, so the most popular answer was D, and it is in fact D, uh, and there are some clues, you know, triangular facies and stuff, but we'll go over all of these syndromes. Uh, another pop question, most cardiac abnormality in a patient with these skin or nail findings, we'll, we'll name them later on in the lecture, look at them and put your choice. And the answer is, yes, it is a rhabdomyoma, okay? So this is, these are tuberous sclerosis features. All right. So trisomy 21, most common autosomal chromosome abnormality, increase in advanced maternal age. They have the typical Down syndrome facies, which you all know. These are the features. Uh, they have non-cardiac abnormalities. The famous ones are duodenal atresia, thyroid abnormalities, Hirschsprung disease, and leukemia. From a cardiac standpoint, the number, depending on which text you use, varies between 40 to 50 percent have congenital heart disease, the most common being AV canal defect or endocardial cushion defect, followed by VSD, followed by ASD, followed by tetralogy of fellow. Everybody with trisomy 21, because of their high incidence of congenital heart disease, should be evaluated either with an echocardiogram or by a PEDS cardiologist. Trisomy 18, or Edwards syndrome, E for election age, 18. So phenotypic features include microcephaly, low set ears, micrognathia, cleft lip and palate, clenched hands and overlapping digits, rocker bottom feet, and prominent occiput. 90%, uh, so the vast majority have congenital heart disease, ASD, VSD, PDA, tetralogy, coarctation. When you hear the word polyvalvar disease, that also goes highly with trisomy 18. Low survival with no interventions. Trisomy 13, or Patau, P for puberty, that's 13, age 13. So microcephaly, holoprosencephaly, so midline defects, eye abnormalities, coloboma, scalp defect is a nice buzzword to remember, clefts, overlapping fingers, polydactyly is another buzzword. Again, the majority have congenital heart disease, very similar to trisomy 18, but also higher incidence of dextrocardia and higher mortality with no intervention. This is an example of the scalp defects that you could see. Turner syndrome or monosomy X, um, 
believe it or not, it does have extremely high rate of fetal loss. Only 5 to 10 percent survive to birth, and those that do survive to birth will have these typical phenotypic features that you re really should know. So short stature, low set posteriorly rotated ears, excessive nuchal skin or webbed neck, the low posterior hairline, the, the broad chest with widely spaced nipples, the wide carrying angle, thyroid disease, peripheral lymphedema either in utero or at birth, and you see it here, ovarian dysgenesis, which leads to you know, the, um, delayed or absent puberty, uh, short metacarpals and metatarsals as shown here. When you hear Turner syndrome, from my perspective, think left side of the heart. So Turner, left side of the heart. Turner, left side of the heart. So bicuspid aortic valve, coarctation, which can happen together, aortic dilatation and rupture, and hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So very important slide. Noonan syndrome has a lot of the external phenotypic features of um, uh, Turner syndrome, but just remember that Noonan obviously can happen in both, in both boys and girls, uh, as opposed to Turner's, which can only happen in girls. They have short stature, low set ears, webbed neck, low hairline, lymphedema, broad chest, so many of the phenotypic features of uh, Turner's, but they have some ptosis and down slanting palpebral fissures as well. Unlike Turner's, though, they have other set of uh, linked congenital heart defects. The most famous one that I'd like to remember is dysplastic pulmonary valve with pulmonary stenosis. That's the most important one to remember. Also hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which interestingly can affect both the left and the right sides of the heart, okay? In addition to other defects. PTPN11 mutation is the, the most common one, which is also found in leopard syndrome and CRAS mutation. So 22Q11 is the most frequent microdeletion in man, also known as DeGeorge. They have these phenotypic features, long face, hypertellurism, micrognathia, short palpebral fissures, and short philtrum, cleft, palate, bifid uvula, velopharyngeal incompetence. They obviously have cal calcium abnormalities, immune deficiency. A lot of them have congenital heart defects, and all of these, I want you to remember these buzzwords. So if you hear interrupted aortic arch, think DeGeorge. If you hear truncus arteriosus, think the George. If you're tetralogy of fellow, think the George. Vascular ring, also think the George. But these are the main ones that I highlighted, diagnosed by Fish. Williams syndrome is a microdeletion also of chromosome 7. They have hypercalcemia, particularly early on in infancy, developmental delay, which despite that they have precocious superficial social and verbal skills. These are the typical features which you should never miss. I mean, they are really very, very typical. So Williams syndrome, mostly sporadic, can be autosomal dominant uh, you know, inheritance once developed. 50% have cardiovascular abnormalities. When you th hear Williams syndrome, think diffuse arterial lesions, arterial lesions. So Williams syndrome, arterial lesions, which can happen either on the pulmonary side, so supravalvar pulmonary stenosis, or branch pulmonary artery stenosis. These often improve with time. On the other hand, on the other side of the heart, supravalvar aortic stenosis is typically progressive and may involve the coronary artery origins. So because it's above the aortic valve, it can involve the takeoff of the coronary arteries and cause osteostenosis, and therefore coronary abnormalities. If it involves the renal arteries, it will cause hypertension, or it could be just a very generalized smallness of the entire arterial tree. This is an example of branch pulmonary artery stenosis. This is an example of how supravalvar aortic stenosis looks like and see how close it is to the, to the, uh, to the uh, coronary arteries and that's why it can cause coronary artery stenosis. So halt oram syndrome is also known as the heart hand syndrome, typically mutation of the TBX5 gene. The cardiac abnormalities that you should remember with that one is a secundum AST and conduction abnormalities. Allergial syndrome, which we already alluded to in the question. So typically has a broad forehead and pointed chin, and therefore triangular facies. They have a bunch of eye abnormalities, liver, paucity of bile ducts, or even biliary atresia. Skeletal, again, hemivertebrae. Usually right-sided congenital heart disease. So Turner, left-sided heart disease. Allergil, right-sided congenital heart disease. Mostly JAG1 mutations. So what, when I say right-sided heart disease, it means peripheral pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary valve stenosis or tetralogy of fallot. Triangular facies, hemivertebrae, if you have you know, two hemivertebrae, they form a, what's called a butterfly vertebrae. All right, tuberous sclerosis, also autosomal dominance. Two-thirds are sporadic, mostly involve the TS1 and TS2 genes. 
They lead to abnormalities of the brain, so seizures, mental retardation, cortical tubers, and subependymal nodules. From a cardiac standpoint, they are the most common cause of rhabdomyomas. And these are really pathognom, like I shouldn't say pathognomonic, they're very typical skin findings. Adenoma sebaceum, this is what a chagrin patch looks like, ungual fibroma, and hype, you know, we call these the ash leaf spots or hypopigmented spot. And so when you see these, think rhabdomyoma. Marfan syndrome is a connective tissue disease, fibrillin 1 mutation, which, uh, which is substrate for elastin, and that's why it affects the arteries. 75% uh, inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion, 25% developed de novo, de novo. And the most important cardiac abnormalities are mitral valve prolapse, which again should give you a click, or aortic dilatation, which is the most dreaded complication. Why? Because it's the substrate for dilatation, uh, severe dilatation, which can predispose to sudden and catastrophic aortic dissection, which is why we only let them participate in low intensity sports. Just mind you, these are from the old Ghent criteria, um, which have been recently revised, but I do like this table because it breaks it down slightly, nicely into skeletal, skin, cardiac, eye, and family genetic history. So these are some you know, things for you to look at to remember what are a lot the manifestations of Marfan syndrome. Some buzzwords to remember with maternal either conditions or exposure. So diabetes can predispose you to have transposition, VSD coarctation in the baby. Also, if there's uncontrolled blood sugar in mom, there'll be uncontrolled blood sugar in the fetus, which causes excessive insulin, which will lead to excessive de deposition of glycogen in the tissue, including the heart, which is why they have also left ventricular hypertrophy. If you hear lithium in mom, think Epstein's abnormality in the fetus. Alcohol in mom can cause VSD, ASD, tetralogy. And finally, lupus in mom should make you think of congenital heart block, or if the, the antibodies affect the entire myocardium, you can have dilated cardiomyopathy. So what is the most likely etiology, known etiology of chest pain in children? Mitral valve prolapse, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, hiatal hernia, chest wall pain, or environmental allergies? And I would like a 100% correct answer on that one, please. All right, let's see that 100%. One, two, three. Here we go. Almost, almost, almost. All right. So I like this slide because I really, when, you know, when I say it's not the heart, most of the time, you know, I want people to know that I'm saying the truth. But we obviously have to rule out the heart. But the most common would be chest wall pain. So what are the things that you should uh, cover with pre-sports participation? So you ask about family history of dilated or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, Marfan syndrome, aortic aneurysms or dissections, any family history of muscular dystrophy, which would predispose to dilated cardiomyopathy, long QT syndrome, obviously, and P. disease is going to talk about arrhythmias, and finally, any family history of sudden, premature, unexplained death. All right, so quickly about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is an abnormality of myocardial cells which leads to hypertrophy. It can either be concentric hypertrophy or focal hypertrophy. So if it's concentric hypertrophy involving the entire left ventricle, you should rule out things like hypertension or things like if you have mild concentric hypertrophy, it could be just athlete's heart, a well-conditioned individual. So you have to rule out those carefully. Or if it's focal hypertrophy, then it's definitely pathologic. So it typically happens, this hypertrophy is sub leading to what we call dynamic outflow obstruction. It used to be known as IHSS. Now we call it hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. It looks something like this. So if this is normal, this is a big chunk of muscle in the left ventricular outflow tract under the aortic valve. So as the cavity is contracting, the cavity gets smaller and sort of starts obliterating itself and causing what we call the dynamic outflow obstruction. So systolic function contractility is preserved. The problem is not with the systolic function of the heart. It is with the thickness and stiffening and abnormal diastolic function and also substrate for arrhythmias which can cause catastrophic sudden death. So it is autosomal dominant. Most mutations involve the sarcomeric proteins. 40% of these mutations are sporadic. If you see hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in infants, you should also think of the storage disorders, such as Pompe's disease. The symptoms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy mostly have to do with either the diastolic dysfunction or the uh, arrhythmia. So it can present with dyspnea on exertion, syncope, chest pain, or unfortunately, sudden death. 
you can hear, uh, the, you know, it's S3, S4, which signify uh, increased uh, LV filling uh, pressures. Uh, you can have a double apical impulse because of that dynamic outflow obstruction that worsens with systole, you know, as systole goes by. You can have a systolic ejection murmur at the left sternal border, and these are the important distinctions you should, you should do on exam. If you do a Valsalva maneuver or you make them stand and the murmur goes up, that should make you think of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Why? Think of that picture. Well, if you do Valsalva maneuver, you'll have increased thoracic pressure, decreased filling of the left ventricle. With decreased filling, the cavity becomes smaller and you worsen the outflow obstruction. And for similar reasons, if you stand up, the blood pools in your legs, there's less of that blood in circulation and in, inside your left ventricle worse outflow obstruction. If you squat, on the other hand, this should force all that blood back into your circulation from your legs, so you increase the preload and you decrease the murmur. And with hand gripping, you increase the afterload and uh, decrease the murmur. So EKG is 90% sensitive, but the, the test of choice is echocardiography. Nowadays, we also use MRI. Treatment is what with moderate exercise restriction. We also use beta or calcium channel blockers to slow down the heart and improve the filling of that ventricle. Defibrillator is only for high-risk features, um, massive hypertrophy, VTAC, unexplained syncope, uh, or family history of sudden cardiac death, uh, with generally by these people a defibrillator. Also, if you have paradoxical decrease in your blood pressure with exercise, that usually means that there is uh, severe dynamic LV alpha obstruction that worsens with activity. Dilated cardiomyopathy, on the other hand, is also due to myocardial damage, but this leads to LV enlargement and systolic, not diastolic, systolic dysfunction. Causes are viral myocarditis, anthracycline toxicity from prior chemotherapy, muscular dystrophies, nutritional such as uh, thiamine deficiency, or familial dilated cardiomyopathy. So if you see an infant with new onset dilated cardiomyopathy and mitral regurgitation and Q waves on the EKG in one and AVL, uh, think L kappa, anomalous origin of the left coronary artery from the pulmonary artery. So the coronary is actually coming from the pulmonary artery, not from the aorta. And as the pulmonary artery pressure starts decreasing after birth, you cause ischemia to the coronary artery, and this leads to a picture very similar to dilated cardiomyopathy. This is surgically repairable, so that's why we have to identify those. It, they can present with failure to thrive, fatigue, and increased work of breathing, tachypnea, gallop rhythm due to S3, S4, mitral, mitral regurgitation murmur, jugular venous distension, hepatomegaly, edema, cool extremi extremities, and displaced apical impulse due to enlargement of the left ventricle. Chest x-ray obviously will go show cardiomegaly, but the echo is obviously the diagnostic test to show di dilatation and dysfunction of the left ventricle. We treat them with um, heart failure medications, so diuretics, ACE inhibitors. If they have severe dysfunction, they can have clot formation in their ventricle, so we do anticoagulation only for severe dysfunction. And finally, transplant if all else fails. So these are, we mentioned family history, now quickly personal history. So these are the things that you should ask about. Do you have any prior heart disease, including history of Kawasaki disease? History of heart murmur should also make you very um, attentive to that. Systemic hypertension, fatigue, syncope or near syncope, any excessive or unexplained exertional dyspnea, exertional chest pain, medication or history, including illicit drug use. So these are the red flags on history. We talked about red flags on physical exam. Red flags on history should be syncope or near syncope on exertion, chest pain on exertion, excessive dyspnea or fatigue with activity. So these are the buzzwords for cardiac, is with activity. Family history of Marfan, cardiomyopathy, lung QT, sudden death, we mentioned those. Irregular rhythm should make you look for arrhythmias with an EKG. Weak or absent lower extremity pulses should make you think coarctation. Hypertension, you know, you evaluate their hypertension, particularly for coarctation. Loud systolic murmur, any diastolic murmur. And then finally, stigmata of genetic syndromes associated with cardiovascular disease, such as Marfan. So here's also for the primary care evaluation of chest pain. Again, most of them, according to this paper, are idiopathic. The most common known cause is musculoskeletal chest pain, et cetera. And then you look at the heart is far down in that list, 4%. So chest wall pain is usually sharp, localized. Episodes usually last seconds to minutes, but can recur over months. Usually worse with deep breathing because you stretch the, the chest wall. It's reproducible on exam and you treat it with NSAIDs. These are the different sort of um, uh, 
you know, chest wall pain syndrome, such as costochondritis, two to three contiguous junctions that are cephalad and unilateral. TG syndrome is very rare. Um, it's, uh, you actually have swollen and uh, warm uh, costochondral junction. Nonspecific chest wall pain, wall pain is as the name suggests, and you typically elicit it by anterior posterior compression of the chest wall. And slipping rare, rare rib syndrome, I've never seen it. It produces intense pain, and you reproduce it with the hooking maneuver where you place your fingers under the inferior margin and pull anteriorly and watch them scream. All right, so the less common causes of chest pain are asthma. So the buzzwords you look for are a history of asthma, ATP, exertional cough, family history of asthma. Obviously, there could be other things going on like infection, pneumonitis, bronchitis. Obviously, you look for herpes zoster. GI diseases like GERD, esophagitis. Children may not volunteer the typical heartburn description, but uh, you look for clues like worse after meals or supine position. And then pneumothorax is pretty uncommon. Cardiac disease. What are the cardiac players in chest pain? So pericarditis, worse in supine, better with leaning forward. They have diffuse EKG abnormalities, diffuse ST changes, which evolve over time into T-wave inversions, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, severe valvular heart disease. So severe aortic stenosis can cause cardiac chest pain, but obviously you should hear a very loud murmur on exam, right? Mitral valve prolapse is a controversial cause of chest pain. And finally, anything that has to do with the coronaries. So if they have Kawasaki syndrome with, with coronary artery involvement, Williams syndrome with involvement of the coronary ostia, as we already mentioned, anomalous origin of the coronary arteries is the second most ca common cardiac cause of sudden death in athletes after hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we as cardiologists should be, do a very good job in seeing the origin of the coronary arteries. That's very important. And finally, coronary artery fistula, rare as a cause of chest pain. So you basically have fistula stealing blood away from the coronary arteries. Usually, most of them are small and don't cause any chest pain. If they are large and they cause coronary steel, they really ought to produce a continuous murmur. All right, so when do you refer a child, child to chest pain to cardiology or other specialists? Acute distress, significant trauma, pain associated with syncope, dizziness, palpitations, exertion, send them to me. History of cardiac or Kawasaki disease, send them to me. Pulmonary perfusion, pneumothorax present. Serious emotion problems, do not send them to me. Esophageal foreign body or caustic congestion, you obviously send them to the ER or the GI doc. All right, so let's talk quickly about congestive heart failure. It is a clinical syndrome in which the heart is unable to pump enough blood to the body to meet the needs. It is either due to decreased cardiac function, which is broken down to either systolic or diastolic dysfunction, or the heart's fine, but there's just increased demands with normal cardiac muscle function. So when do you see this increased demand? When you have left to right shunting, such as with a VSD or a PDA. So it's not that the heart is, is not sufficient, it's that there's increased demand on the heart because of that left to right shunt. So they typically have that pulmonary overcirculation and pulmonary congestion, increased workload in the heart, increased caloric demand and failure to thrive, and all the other constellation that goes with heart failure. Or if you have a runoff lesion, such as a vein of gallon malformation that's stealing blood and causing a high output heart failure. Or if the pump is fine, but there's a lot of valve regurgitation that's making it inefficient as a pump. Or if you have sepsis, which starts with high output cardiac failure, and then the heart can poop out and progress to low output heart failure. Severe anemia or thyrotoxicosis are examples of increased demand. So, uh, here is sort of, it's it kind of, you don't have to, you know, so just know, be familiar with this, that depending on the age span, you can have different etiologies. And in the first week of life, if you if kids present with heart failure, think of hypoplastic left heart syndrome and inadequate left heart output, vein of gallon malformation, critical aortic stenosis, or critical pulmonary stenosis, or total anomalous pulmonary venous return is, a, is an important entity which we'll talk about. Or in premature infants, think patent ductus arteriosus. One to four weeks is when other things start to manifest like coarctation. Some aortic stenosis can present in that time span. Or now some of the left to right shunting lesions as the pulmonary artery pressure starts going down will start to manifest themselves, particularly in premature babies and truncus arteriosus. Then once you go past six weeks, that's when the pulmonary vascular resistance has gone down mostly. So that's when all the shunt lesions, you know, VSD, AV canal, large PDA start manifesting themselves. Or if you have anomalous origin of the left coronary artery from the pulmonary artery, that's when you start having steel and coronary ischemia.
So you can either also break it into congenital heart disease versus acquired heart disease, uh, or it could be due to myocardial dysfunction. Think metabolic abnormalities, dilated cardiomyopathy. And then some miscellaneous cause, causes like chronic tachycardia, unrecognized chronic tachycardia can cause the heart muscle to weaken, complete AV block, severe anemia, or if they have significant hypertension. So what, what do we look for? Poor weight gain, poor feeding in infant. That's their main exercise is feeding. Or in older children, you see anorexia and nausea. Dyspnea on exertion or with feeding, again, because feeding is their main infant's exercise. Diaphoresis during feeds, baseline tachycardia, tachypnea, increased work of breathing, retractions. Cardiac wheezing, it's rare to have rals in, in congestive heart failure in children. Cough. Hepatomegaly, puffy face, especially eyelids. Pedal edema is rare in children. And then finally, a gallop rhythm, which suggests an S3 or S4 and cool extremities. How do you manage them? You use oxygen for comfort, unless the congestive heart failure is caused by left to right shunts. Then you do not want to use oxygen because it will make them worse. Diuretics, generally we use Lasix. Beware of hypokalemia, hyperchloremia, contraction alkalosis, and hypercalciuria. ACE inhibitors, those generally decrease the afterload. They decrease the blood pressure, so they decrease the afterload on the heart, but they also uh, help with cardiac remodeling. Beta blockers used to be a no-no for heart failure, and now we know that heart failure, a lot of it has to do with inappropriate hyperadrenergic states, so we do use things like carvedilol, but we start low and go slow. Digoxin is the famous medication. Beware of, if you use it with diuretics, beware of hypokalemia, which can exacerbate the joxin toxicity. And then graded exercise regimen and salt restriction. Now, on the other hand, we can deal with acute cardiogenic shock, which is an acute failure of the cardiovascular system to supply the demands of the body. Again, similar uh, etiology to the one we already mentioned in newborns, think of left heart obstructive lesions, coarct, hypoplastic left heart AS, myocarditis, you know, infant, you know, fetal or uh, newborn myocarditis, tachyarrhythmia, so if there's uncontrolled SVT in utero, it can cause heart failure and, you know, and cardiogenic shock in utero or immediately after birth, and sepsis, again, can, can start with high output and lead to burnout. In older children, you also think of sepsis, myocardial infarction from the other coronary abnormalities we mentioned, or acquired myocarditis and inflammation. Some of the similar manifestations to chronic congestive heart failure, so pale, tachycardia, tachypnea, but they can also have hypotension because they're decompensated with narrow pulse pressure, low urine output, and metabolic acidosis. You evaluate them with chest x-ray, EKG, but really the mainstay from my perspective is an echocardiogram and a consult. So if, they're, if they have respiratory failure, you obviously want to intubate and mechanically ventilate them to also ease the workload on the heart. You use positive inotropic agents, and we'll, I'll, I'll summarize those in the next slide. You use afterload reducing agents such as milrinone and nipride. You use diuretics. You, you are very carefully replacing fluids, not going overboard with fluid replacement. These are some of the inotropes, just for your own reference. And finally, the hypercholesterolemia guidelines, you know, the, the main highlights, this is obviously a very long, very long guidelines, and you can refer to this expert panel uh, for, for reference, but generally children with an average LDLC of more than 250, you have to refer them to a lipid specialist. If the LD, uh, LDLC remains elevated more than 190, despite lifestyle modifications for six months, in a child who is more than 10 years old, statin therapy. What about if it's borderline despite intervention? So you have somebody who's older than 10, you do interventions for six months, and it's still sort of between 160 and 190, but this time you have additional risk factors like family history, premature coronary vascular, uh, cardiovascular disease, or one high-level risk factor or two moderate risk factors you consider statin therapy. And I'll show you those in the next slide. And finally, for younger children, ages eight to nine. So the youngest we use statin for is age, you know, age eight. And if, you, if they have, but you have to have a higher threshold to use it in, lo, in younger children, so LDLC of more than non, 190, after a trial of lifestyle modifications and multiple first degree family members uh, with premature coronary vascular or cardiovascular disease or more than one high risk level 
high level risk factor or more than two moderate risk factors. So basically, you know, so you have to have a higher threshold for younger children, eight to nine. And basically, on the other hand, if they're more than 10 and they're more than 190 statin, if they're 160 to 190 with other risk factors, you consider statin therapy. This is from that same guideline paper that shows you some of those high risk features and moderate risk features. That's it for the first talk, and we have 30 more seconds. There you go.